This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to yet another episode of Tao Unbound. I'm Ido Aharoni, your host, and today it gives me great pleasure to introduce a couple of scientists that collaborated on something very, very interesting. We're privileged to have with us Professor Lila Hadani. Her title is very impressive, so I have to read it from my iPhone. She is the head of the Hadani Lab. She is a member of the School of Plant Sciences and Food Security at the Faculty of Life Sciences. And she investigates plant bioacoustics, uh, open questions in the theory of evolution, and other issues in the field of biology. And we are anxious to hear from you. She is joined by Professor Yossi Yovel, who is the head of the Sagol School for Neuroscience at Tel Aviv University. He's a professor in the Department of Zoology and at the Steinhardt Museum of Natural History. And on top of it, which is also going to be very interesting, is the head of the Bat Lab. If you've heard of the movie Batman, this is a guy that will tell us about the connection between science and Hollywood. But we're here to talk about their joint um, research. And as usual, we begin our podcast with, you know, a little bit of background, personal background. We'll start with you, Professor Hadani. If you can tell us a little bit about yourself, your upbringing, your background, your academic uh, uh, career so far, and how did you end up where you are? So I studied in Tel Aviv University and studied mostly uh, mathematics and biology which led me to the field of evolutionary theory. And this is still uh, a major uh, topic in my lab, where we study open questions in evolutionary theory, like evolution of cooperation, evolution of sexual reproduction, etc. And in the context of this project, it all started from an open question in evolutionary theory of why plants uh, Would not make. Yeah, so b- before we jump into this particular project, so you are a product of Tel Aviv University. Where were you raised in, in, the, states of, in the state of Israel? Where are you from? I'm from Tel Aviv. I was born in Tel Aviv, <laughs> grew up in Tel Aviv, <laughs> and live in Tel Aviv today. I had a s- short uh, detour at Stanford, and now I'm back here. So you, you, are, you were born and raised in Tel Aviv. You're a graduate of Tel Aviv University. You're a product of this institution. And with the exception of a few years at, in California, where you studied at Stanford and researched at Stanford, you spent your entire life here. That's incredible. And were you, as a, as a young person, were you drawn to natural life, to uh, you know, plants or any of the stuff that you're dealing with today? When did you discover that this is what you'd like to be doing for the rest of your life? I think the current project is a complete surprise for me. I was interested in biology uh, from childhood, but what I'm actually doing uh, took a few years to find out, especially as uh, so people do not uh, study evolution at high school usually. Yes, and, uh, and, and we will talk about um, why it's important to understand about the life of uh, plants in order to improve the life of, uh, of human beings. And to you, Professor Yovel, so tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, your career. I know that you're also very closely tied to, to our university. Yeah, true. I, I actually grew up in, uh, in Beersheva in the south, and I was, uh, apropos your question, I was always interested in animals. I was always uh, wandering around. It was like the, the border of the desert, so I was uh, looking for desert animals. Yeah, I did my undergrad in Tel Aviv University. I knew I wanted to do animals. I always knew this, uh, you know, whether being a vet or a photographer, I knew that I want to do something with animals. Uh, I studied, I did a double major in physics and biology, and that's what uh, drew me to bats. Um, I was looking for some combination between animal behavior and physics. And uh, then I discovered, uh, by the way, through another professor in Tel Aviv University, Noga Kornfeld Cho, I did a project with her. And, uh, and she said, why not studying bats and studying their sonar? You know, bats use sound to orient in the world, uh, which is physics, pure physics. And this was just a perfect combination for me. Now, what can you tell us about the bat population in Israel? 
<laughs> how so, many how yeah. many do you think we have yeah we have uh, millions probably but uh, you know the numbers are less important number of species or diversity is more important for the ecological system usually uh, so actually we have 32 or 33 species of bats which is quite a lot uh, for Israel it's uh, um, you know if you compare it to, to North America or North uh, Europe uh, we have more species than in those places because we are on the border you know between northern countries and southern countries we have both desert and um, temperate zones, um, but uh, interestingly, it's almost uh, a third um, of mammalian species in Israel that are bats. So we have something like 100 uh, species of mammals, and a third of them are bats, which is more uh, worldwide. Bats account for something like 20, 25 percent of. And in terms species. of their location, is there a certain region? That... E everywhere, most of them. I, I should say most of our well, at least in Israel, most of the viewers are more familiar with the fruit bats. Uh, which are the largest, they're the only ones that eat fruit, they're the ones that are very, they dwell in cities, and that's why people are familiar with them. But most of our bats, 31, 32 species, are actually insectivorous bats. Most of them are tiny, most of them weigh than, less than 10 grams as adults, okay, or, or less than 20 grams. And they, they, are, they, they are mostly cryptic, they do not interact with humans, and of course they eat insects, which is great for agriculture, great for, uh, um, they serve as biological pesticides, uh, very good for the, very important for the ecological system. So you're here. You're doing something very important to our audience because you're you're teaching us something that we didn't know, that most bats are actually very very small, and they're nothing like what a bat became in popular culture. Very similar to what the movie Jaws did to shark population. That really. It's not as hostile as people think. Right, right. Now, the connection between the two of you, Professor Hadani, started um, in the field of what you call bioacoustics, right? The big question, um, do plants make noise? Do plants can hear? And you somehow figured out that it must have something to do with Professor Yovel's research. Well, I, th I think that... The, um theoretical question here bothered people like since Darwin because plants are communicating with animals all the time with pollinators and with herbivores and all these animals are making sounds and responding to sounds so why would plants be in the middle of all this deaf and mute so I was puzzled by that uh, for some time and I didn't find any good uh, reason for this situation. And so I started thinking that the answer might be the other way around, that plants are using uh, sound for communication, but we don't hear them. And then I met Yossi on <laughs> new faculty event, and uh, we decided to... To collaborate on this. And, and you're, so what you did basically was you basically turned the table on the question, right? You said, rather than assuming that plants are mute, let me assume the other way, that they actually can, are capable of receiving and producing uh, sound, and let's try to prove that, right? That's what you did. Or at least test that. At least test. Okay, so how did you go about testing it? So actually we started with uh, receiving sound. Uh, this is a, a slightly older project that was published a few years ago. And, uh, well, there were many, you know, there the, are the many types of sound and you need to find, if, you need to think which one, I hypothesize, which one is functional for the plant. And I think then uh, Lilach came up with, the, with this, this idea that, you know, some plants that are pollinated by insects might, uh, it might be beneficial for them to respond to the sound of an insect. Now, what is the sound of, the, of an insect? Uh, insects produce different sounds, but you know, one very common one is the wing beat of their wings, which produces this buzz. You know, we are familiar with it. If, uh, if a mosquito comes near our, near our ear, we, oh, yeah. we hear this annoying. So this buzz is actually their wing beat. Okay. Um, and then, uh, well, maybe Lilach will elaborate a little bit but, um, about how, she, how they chose the exact plant, because this was more on their side. But eventually what we end up de doing is uh, to take a flower, um, and to uh, broadcast the sound of the wing beat of a, a, of a bee, of a honeybee, which is around 200 hertz, so it sounds like zzz, something like this. Um, and to measure nectar, the, sh the sugar concentration in the nectar, 
and to find that uh, indeed once the sound is uh, produced near the flower, within a few minutes the, the production of sugar increases in the plant. And, and, and Professor Hadani, would that be increase in the production of sugar? Would, would you describe that as a benefit for the plant, right? Can you tell us a little bit about what are the benefits that could possibly be for the plant from this interaction? So the question why we chose this particular scenario, we thought where would sound be important for the plant? So pollination is a situation where a plant has a close interaction with an animal that is crucial for the reproduction of the plant. And so, and the animal is making sounds. And so while we knew that uh, plants make flowers with color and uh, smell, that signal to the pollinator, the question was the other way around, can they respond to a, a signal of the pollinator? And then what would we expect them to do? So they could do all sorts of things, but by changing the reward that the pollinator is getting, they achieve at least uh, two uh, benefits. One is the pollinator tends to stay longer if the nectar is uh, sweeter, and the other, which is potentially more important, is that the pollinators tend to look for another flower that is similar to this one, when the reward was good. And so the chance for productive uh, pollination that brings the pollen from one flower to another flower of the same species is increased. Now, the obvious question, which I'd like to pose to both of you, um, if you can, again, make it accessible to our listeners. Why is it important for the environment, what you discovered? You want to start, Ilach? <laughs> so, pollination is critical for uh, many, many uh, species of plants. Um, depend on animals for their uh, reproduction. And at the moment, we also have a pollination crisis because the populations of uh, pollinators are declining. And so understanding the, uh, what is happening in uh, pollination, uh, another component that affects uh, the plant and also the response of the pollinator can um, help us understand how to help in certain cases, potentially understand the, the impacts of um, uh, noises on the environment, on the uh, plant uh, side, and then uh, potentially, if they can hear the pollinators, then they may be hearing other sounds that are relevant. So, and this, would you say, is the next frontier in the research uh, that you're doing in bioacoustics? I think... Uh, Possibly exploring the possibility they can hear other uh, actors in nature. I think this is one uh, other direction that now um, seems more likely. That's fascinating. I should also say to our listeners that that particular research that you did received really unprecedented level of exposure all over the world. And so if people are interested, they can simply Google it up uh, and, and read more about it in, in the leading publications in the world. Professor Yovel. So um, back to the same question about the, the environment. Yes. Yeah. Why is it important to the environment? Yeah, so the question is also who is the environment? Are you thinking about humans or in general? Maybe I'll say a few... Uh, yeah, in general. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few points. So, I mean, just like Lilach said, I think understanding, you know, a lot of our research is just based on a, an attempt to understand how things work out there in nature. And we don't always know what is this good for. In most cases, both of us are doing very basic science, which is what, you know, universities, it's the only place in the world where you can do basic science is basically universities, right? Because the rest of the world is always seeking revenue. And we don't always understand where this is leading to, except for a better understanding. But we know there are 
dozens of examples, you know, from quantum physics, which today is used for computations, to uh, the, the, the understanding the structure of uh, the, the rib ribosome or other organelles, which then leads to a development of, uh, uh, of uh, different uh, medications, right? So, so when we start this research, we don't know uh, what is it good for down the, world, the, down the road. Um, as just as Ilach said, we're trying to understand the actors, the channels of communication in nature, uh, and this is a, a, a super, I would say, it's a very substantial um, understanding because as Lilach said, until uh, recently, most people thought that there is no sound communication, uh, sound-based communication between plants and uh, animals, and now we know that there is a whole new uh, channel of communication that can be explored. Now, you know, our listeners um, are people that care deeply about the university and they're curious about the work that you do, and I noticed that you both had labs. Uh, and I'd like to hear from you, and again, for the benefit of our listeners, tell us, you know, the a brief description of your lab. What is it about? And how can we as a community, because at the end of the day, the university is a community, how can we help, achieve, help you to achieve your goals in your lab? Tell us about the Hadani lab, and then we'll hear from Professor Yovel about the bat lab. Um. So my lab currently has uh, two uh, directions that are interacting, but one is completely uh, theoretical and computational of evolutionary models of uh, host microbiome uh, interactions, evolution of aging, and uh, some models of evolution of plants and uh, So when you're talking about evolution of aging, all forms of aging or only in in plants? All forms of aging. All forms of aging. So theory tends to apply to... To uh, everything. To large groups of uh, species. That's interesting. Um, because, you know, this is a, a hugely important area and I think it's one of the fastest growing areas. In, because a lot of people connect that to the growth in the importance of wellness and, and, of course, preventive medicine and so on. So it's becoming perhaps the hottest topic today in the world is the whole issue of aging. And I think that there's a, there's, that here again, the way to tackle this is to turn the table on the issue, meaning to say, let's assume that aging is a disease. If we make that assumption, then maybe we can heal that disease, we can find the solution. Is that your approach? So I think this is... Uh, another approach that is um, very productive, but we take a different approach where we assume that uh, genes that affect aging has undergone natural selection. And where would natural selection lead aging in different uh, organisms with different lifestyles? So you're saying if we understand the evolutionary process of the gene selection, then we can affect aging. That's your theory. Potentially. Wow. And they're also thinking of the potential for plasticity in aging. So how would stress and aging uh, be expected? Well, I'm sure many of our listeners are pretty concerned about the fact that they're getting old. And, <laughs> and I think you're offering them some, some light at the end of the tunnel here. We hope so. And what, what are your goals for the future when you talk about your lab? So... As I said, we, we currently have uh, two sides. So the other side is doing uh, plants bioacoustics with different questions on uh, plants and sounds. And I think, um, I think I intend, at least in the next few years, to continue in both directions. So there are exciting questions in evolutionary theory that we think um, would guide our intuition in uh, new directions. And there is more um, experimental computational part of understanding the secret language of plants. Wow, that's amazing. Professor Yovel, can you tell us about your lab, the bat lab? Yeah, so we uh, <laughs> said we study bats. Uh, we are interested in different aspects of them from using their sonar for various um, Applications, so we develop uh, biomimetic robots that use sonar 
you know, they use this ability of bats to use sound to uh, um, perceive the environment. Uh, we have applications in uh, precision agriculture, for example. Uh, we have many um, applications that are related to the environment. Today, there is a very urgent need to monitor the environment, to know which animals are around. Uh, for example, if you build something, uh, you need to know what, what is this doing to the animals. You know, with, our, with all of these global changes that we're experiencing, this is becoming a, a very urgent need. And, and we do a lot of this with uh, acoustic monitoring. So we're experts on uh, placing microphones, uh, analyzing the signals today, using AI mostly, trying to understand what's around us. Uh, maybe I'll connect to this aging point because bats are actually um, uh, the, the, the world champions among mammals in age in aging or in longevity. So we know that uh, mammals live, there's a strong correlation between the size of the mammal and, and its longevity, right? Elephants live uh, 60, 70, 80 years, and you know, mice live two years. Bats, which are mostly the size of, uh, of mice, as we've learned, uh, live up to 40, 50 years, okay? So 20 or 30 times more than expected for a mammal. Uh, this is also connected to what Lilach said about lifestyle. Their lifestyle is very different from that of a mouse. They reproduce slowly with uh, only one pup per year. Um, and there, there's no doubt there, that there are many adaptations in their genes uh, that allow them to, to, uh, to be so uh, sustainable and to live so long. And this is something that we started looking at uh, uh, mostly recently. One of the big advantages is that we have our own colony of, uh, of bats. Uh, uh, which, uh, in which the bats are free. So it's basically a wild colony. The bats go in and out as they wish. Uh, I established this colony eight years ago, and by now we already have bats that are eight years old, uh, which is something rare. Usually if you go to a colony of animals in the wild, you don't know the age of the animals. And now we have this ability to follow the same animals year after year, looking at the uh, deterioration of their cognition, looking into their brain, looking into their, their immune now, system. How do you, what technique are you using to follow them? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Um, so actually our expertise developing these miniature sensors, uh, um, GPS sensors, but not only, we have microphones, we have physiological sensors, which we place on the bats uh, in order to follow their behavior outdoors. Um, you know, whatever they do, we, we know. Uh, actually, we can use this to monitor the environment. We recently placed uh, temperature sensors on the bats in order to measure environmental uh, temperature and to show that, the, the uh, for example, Tel Aviv center is much more uh, warm than uh, the outskirts. For now, what are the um, applied uh, implications of, of, of your work when it comes to the well-being of human beings? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier already that, that you know, we do a lot of work on uh, robotics using sonar mostly, using this uh, sensory, unique bat uh, sensory ability. Um, in order to uh, um, assist uh, robots. Uh, we have several projects, and one of them, for example, we uh, use sonar in order to, we do what, what is called yield estimate. We need to know, you know, farmers want to know how much uh, tomatoes or, or whatever are there in their, uh, uh, in their greenhouse, and we show that we can do this with acoustics. Uh, recently, we're also involved in a project that allows uh, uh, for autonomic navigation. So uh, many of these uh, vehicles, autonomous vehicles, not on roads, but off-road vehicles, they have a very difficult problem when there's a small uh, obstacle, bush or rope uh, stretched in front of them. They cannot detect it with the current sensors like LiDAR or cameras. And we find that sonar is uh, very advantageous for these scenarios and we're developing such uh, sensors. And it's being used in, in, um, uh, in maritime life for many, many years, this, this same yeah. technology. Yeah. Well, you know, I can spend hours talking to you guys. I'd like to... Um, um, conclude with um, a question about the future of the collaboration between the two of you and if you can also um, refer to the work that you did with the uh, with the tomato because I know that Professor Hadani uh, brought a little uh, tape with her and to really illustrate what those sounds may may uh, uh, may look like or hear like. So please, Professor Hadani. So um, in a paper that was published recently, we've showed that um, plants also emit sounds. And um, the sounds are not particularly weak. They are around uh, 60 dB, similar to human speech, but they are ultrasonic. And therefore we used uh, uh, microphones from the bat experiments to hear them. 
but moreover, that these sounds contain information about the condition of the plant. Plants mostly emit sounds when they are stressed, and we can identify from the sound which stress it was, at least between uh, dry, cut, and sick. We can also identify the species of the plant from the sounds. And so, while we cannot hear these sounds, there are many animals that are uh, capable of hearing them. And uh, if we can interpret them, probably uh, some animals that have something to gain from this information are also interpreting them. And that opens quite a few other questions. So, clearly, these are sounds that we cannot hear. But we made for demonstration, we converted the sounds to our hearing range. And we also... Um, and we're about to hear a tomato in distress. So, I will uh, put two demonstrations. One is a drying tomato. These are the sounds emitted by one tomato over one hour, but then converted to our hearing range and condensed to a sequence of like... So it's important to, to mention to our listeners that if they go in nature, they will not be able to hear this. We don't hear these sounds, otherwise right. the field would be quite noisy. So it's something like that. One tomato, drying. Wow. But now, we can also um, hear the sounds of a different uh, plant. For example, grapevine. This is one gra grapevine, cut. And even uh, listening um, like that, we can note that the sounds are quite significantly different. They're different, and you're also assuming that the other species out there in nature have the ability to interpret that and to respond to it. So, we are testing it now, but there are animals that hear these sounds all the time, like moths and bats and mice. And another uh, open question is uh, if other plants may be hearing these sounds and responding to them. And I think that there is a Hollywood screen in the making right now <laughs> about this. I think this is a fascinating topic, and I'd like to thank both of you for taking the time to be with us. I'm sure this is not the last time that we're meeting here in the studio. I'd like to wish you really uh, tons of success in your future collaboration, and thank you for everything that you've done. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to our listeners and viewers back home, thank you so much for being with us. Until the next episode, goodbye from Tel Aviv. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat.